right, so we want to derive centripetal uh, equations, basically, or circular motion. So derive equations for circular motion. Um, okay, so the first premise we'll start with is that if an object is uh, moving along and there's no forces acting on it, right, Newton's first law says it will just continue doing that forever, all right? And then Newton's second law basically says if you push the object in the direction it's traveling, its magnitude will increase or decrease depending which way you push on it, okay? These are sort of Newton's first two laws in a nutshell. Um, but what if, instead of increasing or decreasing speed or, you know, um, having this thing come to a stop or accelerating it in the direction of travel, we want it to deviate from its straight line path and move around an arc. Well, in order to do that, when this object comes into the, the curve of our circle, we're going to need to apply a force to it. And that force will have to always aim directly towards the center of the circle. Okay? So in order to have this object deviate from its path, a, right, a force at a right angle to its direction of travel needs to be applied. So here's its velocity at any given time. And you'll notice that in order to make it travel around the circle, we need to apply a force aiming towards the center, which works out to be at a right angle to, um, to the direction of travel. And this just goes to the mathematical concept of tangent, which if you remember, is a line drawn at a right angle to the radius at different spots along the surface of a circle. Okay, so you always get this right angle here. These are considered or called tangent lines. Here we go. Okay, so let's imagine that we have this object it's traveling around the circle. Um, let's draw in vectors showing its velocity at various times. So there we go. Yellow will be its velocity. Put this down here. Okay, and we'll put in a radius value, or write in a radius, I guess I should say. So this is the radius of the circle at different times. Okay. So it's V1 and V2. All right, so these are representing an object moving around the circle at two different times, okay? So we would then say that this happens at T1, and this happens at some time later, T2, and we'll say that we have delta T being the difference in time, okay? Now, the magnitude of velocity will not change, and again, the reason why is because we are applying a force aiming towards the center, and um, we call this centripetal force, as an aside here, centripetal force, which means center, I'm sure you can see that, and seeking, okay? So a center-seeking force. Your Latin's already getting better. All right. Um, and again, the force is not in the direction of the magnitude, so the magnitude is not changing. Just the direction of the forces. Now, if you have a changing velocity, which we do, it's not changing in magnitude, but it's changing in direction, we must have an acceleration, right? And if we have an unbalanced force, which we would here, we must be creating an acceleration. So both the force and the acceleration would be directed towards the center at all times. You can imagine that at any point as this object goes around and around, um, that that would be true, all right? Uh, I'm going to draw in a few more lines here because we're going to need them for doing some derivations. I'm going to try to be quick about this, but it's a little bit time consuming to pull this out of here. Um, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, so acceleration is delta V over delta T. And delta V is equal to the final velocity minus the initial velocity over my change in time. Or, you know, IV cell V minus U over delta T. Okay, so here's U and here's V. So how do I find the difference between two velocities that have the same magnitude but point in different directions? What do I have to do? So I need to go V2 minus V1. Okay, well, let's see here. So there's V2. And there's V1. How do, I, how do I subtract these from each other? How do I do vector subtraction between them? Well, 
Well, I add the opposite vector, do I not? So I'm just doing vector addition, but since I'm saying v2 subtract v1, it's like saying same thing as v2 plus negative v1. So negative v1 is me taking this vector, adding it tip to tail to this vector, but changing the direction of it. So it's aiming over here. Okay. So then the resultant vector that we get from that, the sum of these two, the sum of the subtraction, or the sum of the addition of the negative vector, I guess, probably a better way to say that, is going to be this guy right here. Okay. So that's, that's where we're at here. So let's just write in and label these, see what we get. Oh, I don't like that. There's negative v1. Okay, so there's the subtraction that we have. All right, so if this was a right angle here, this must be a right angle here. Okay, and it turns out actually that you get similar triangles here. So let's label some things. We've got A, we've got B, we've got the center here. Okay, I'm just going to take this, group it, and flip it so it matches the other guy. So actually, just before we flip, something I want to want you to notice here. Um, is that if I were to take this, um, you know, so here's my V, here's my V2, and here's my inverted V1. Look at where delta V points. Um, delta V will point towards the center of the circle at the halfway point between here, right? So there's my delta V. The average of these two points towards the center. Okay, so halfway between any two given points, the sum will point towards the center, which makes sense, right? Our velocity change has to be in the same direction as acceleration. And since force is pointed to the center, acceleration has to be towards the center, and delta V change in velocity has to be towards the center. Okay? So now we're going to label some of these things. Um, this we're going to call R. This we're going to call chord AB. Okay? Um, and we're going to like match those up with this, because it creates a similar triangle. So we're going to find some ratios here. So this is a similar triangle. So this would be the equivalent then of an R value, it would match up with an R value here, okay? Of course, chord AB would match up with delta V, okay? So we should be able to do then is say that chord AB, these are similar triangles, is to a, is to a radius as delta V is to one of these Vs. It doesn't really matter which one, okay? Is to um, one of my Vs. Does that make sense? For similar triangles? Now, this is where we have to make a little bit of a leap. If we shrink the amount of time, right, that this happens over, the chord AB and the arc AB become closer to being the same value, right? So as we shorten this, as you can imagine I move B back here, this moves closer and closer and closer to the arc that we have here. Till eventually, over a small enough time scale, the chord between two points along an arc, say A and B, and the arc, become indistinguishable, all right? So as T, if you want, approaches zero, chord AB approaches the same length as arc AB. Okay, so arc AB then, arc AB is, if you want, the distance that the object travels, or the velocity times time that the object travels, right? So the arc is the distance, if you want, between A and B. Is that correct? So what we're going to do is, is since we're not dealing with arc directly, but if we make this time small enough, we can say that we're dealing with arc. So what we can say then is we can say then that the distance AB over R, um, right, that's the distance, is equal to delta V over V. And then we know that distance is equal to velocity times time, so we can then say this. V times my time interval over R is equal to delta V over V. And then we're just going to do some algebra on this. So we're going to get V squared times delta T over R equals delta V. We're going to divide off t on the other side. We're going to get this, v squared over r equals delta v over t. And what is this known as? 
And now we have a new <clears throat> formula that we can use. That looks like that. And the last step, right, this is centripetal acceleration. This is how to find it. So you take the um, square of velocity and divide it by the radius of the circle. That gives you the centripetal acceleration A sub C. If we multiply both sides by M, okay, so actually let's just put this aside. If we multiply both sides by M, now we have MA here, don't we? So that is actually, since F equals MA, a centripetal force. So we can now say this, MV squared over R equals MA, which we'll just call centripetal force. And, uh, and there we go. So there we have two new formulas that we can use to describe circular motion, okay? So again, I'll just write them in their normal form. FC equals MV squared over R, and AC equals V squared over R. Related to each other just by M.